Hi, my name is Dr. Alyssa Tiller. I'm Hospice Medical Director and Senior Vice President at Hope West in Weston, Colorado. Today, we're going to be talking about fevers at the end of life. Could it be COVID or could it be normal dying? The heat is on. I have nothing to disclose. So here are the objectives. I'm hoping that you'll be able to think about the differential diagnosis of fevers at the end of life and be more confident in determining clinically whether your patient should be designated as a patient under investigation for COVID-19. So how often do you think people experience a fever in the last days to weeks of life? Are you thinking 50% of the time, 100% of the time, 10% of the time? What are your thoughts? What about atelectasis? What about dehydration? How often have you been called by a nurse asking if maybe your patient's fever was due to these? So let's start with a case, Mr. Stronglow. He's a 79 year old man with metastatic lung cancer to the bone. He's bed bound, he stopped eating and drinking, and he's developed a low grade temperature. He's a little bit hypoxic. Should he be a person under investigation for COVID? He's minimally responsive. He's not short of breath. He's not coughing. And actually his hypoxia hasn't changed, but he does have a new tight swelling of his right leg. In this case, his fever is probably secondary to a DVT. Would you test him? Would you treat him? Well, I think that would depend on his goals of care and you would need to think about the incidence of COVID-19 in your area. So about a quarter of patients develop a fever in the last weeks of life. Let's review thermoregulation to try and understand why. So we have temperature receptors in our skin, our cornea, and in our urinary bladder. These receptors feed into the anterior hypothalamus. If the set point of the hypothalamus tells us that we're too cold, then our skin vessels vasoconstrict, keeping blood flow away from our skin. We start shivering, rigors, we develop goosebumps, and we put clothing on and blankets to try and warm up. If the set point of our hypothalamus tells us that we're too hot, our skin vessels vasodilate, allowing heat to dissipate. We start sweating, and we seek shade indoors, and we remove layers of clothing. So when thinking about fevers in the last few weeks of life and thinking about could this be COVID, I think it's important to consider two things. One is the incidence of COVID-19 in your area. If you have a high incidence of COVID-19, then very subtle symptoms, even an isolated fever, you might consider designating your patient as a PUI for COVID. However, if you have a low incidence of COVID, then you'll probably be more strict about your symptoms. And if you can explain the symptoms due to something different, then you would not designate your patient as a PUI for COVID. So when thinking about the etiology of fever at the end of life, there are five general categories to consider. Infection, thrombosis, cancer-related, medication-related, and that secondary to inflammation. Let's talk about infection first. As you know, infections are often the terminal event in patients with dementia. 
There are many different kinds of infections, but the most common would be viral infections or bacterial infections. We often see urinary tract infections and pneumonia at the end of life. They're very common. And of course, in our patients with ascites, we want to think about spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. We want to look for abscesses and cellulitis. And viral infection should be considered also. Of course, we have to consider COVID-19. And during influenza season, we want to be thinking about influenza. So let's talk a moment also about chemical pneumonitis. If a patient aspirates their gastric contents, they get an abrupt onset of fever, shortness of breath, hypoxia, cyanosis, and diffuse crackles. So the next major category is thrombosis. Our patients are often have decreased mobility and they may have increased risk of thrombosis because of cancer, for example. So patients may develop a deep venous thrombosis in their lower extremity, or in patients with liver disease, they may develop portal vein thrombosis. Portal vein thrombosis can also be seen in patients with pancreatitis and cancer. And portal vein thrombosis causes epigastric pain, abdominal distension, ascites, and fever. Of course, patients with a, a DVT can also develop acute pulmonary embolism. And typically, you would get pleuritic chest pain, hypoxia, and shortness of breath. Patients with heart disease can develop a fever post-myocardial infarction. In fact, 17% of patients in one study developed a fever between four hours and five days post-MI. It can also be associated with post-cardiac injury syndrome. And what is post-cardiac injury syndrome? Well, that causes pleuritic chest pain and a pericardial friction erupt. So cancer, can't cancer cause a fever? How does cancer cause a fever apart from venothromboembolism? Well, you can get tumor fevers and cancer can cause inflammatory cytokines. So tumor fever is typically associated with Hodgkin lymphoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, acute or chronic leukemia, sarcoma, pheochromocytoma, cancers that have, that, such as renal cell carcinoma, hepatocellular carcinoma, ovarian cancer, and hypothalamic involvement, either by glioblastoma or metastatic disease to the hypothalamus. Notice that two, that tumor fever is not typically associated with solid tumors such as lung cancer or breast cancer. So tumor fever typically lasts for weeks and has a rapid response to naproxen. In a 1984 study, 22 patients with cancer and fever of unknown origin were studied. 14 out of 15 patients with neoplastic fever had a prompt and sustained lysis of fever within 24 hours of starting naproxen. None of the five patients with infectious origin had a response to naproxen, thus developing what we call the naproxen test. So if you have a patient with typical cancer that causes fever, and remember, leukemias, lymphomas, renal, liver cancer, hypothalamic involvement, then think about giving naproxen and seeing if this causes the fever to abate. 
cancer, as you know, causes inflammatory cytokines. So there are multiple cytokines which lead to decreased appetite, weight loss, and cachexia. Interleukin-6, interestingly enough, shows a sudden steep rise two days prior to death, and this can lead to fever. Very interesting. So what about medications? How can medications cause fevers? Well, there are four different distinct mechanisms where medications can induce a fever or hyperthermia at the end of life. Firstly, medications can interfere with thermoregulation. And I would also point out that if your patient is delirious or lethargic, then they're not gonna be able to do the behavioral changes that we talked about when the hypothalamus set point is not right. They not, may not be able to remove clothing, put more clothing on, snuggle up with blankets, and so on and so forth. But there are other medications can cause hyperthermia. For example, anticholinergics. As you know, anticholinergic delirium causes a red, non-sweating febrile episode and confusion, of course. So tricyclic antidepressants, atropine, antihistamines, haloperidol, prochlorperazine, and thioridazine can all interfere with thermoregulation, stop sweating, stop vasodilation of skin vessels, and cause a fever. Well, actually hypothermia hyperthermia. Amphetamines can cause vasoconstriction, thus causing a fever. So what about neuroleptic malignant syndrome? Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is associated with antipsychotics, including haloperidol and menoclopramide. So up to 3% of patients taking antipsychotics develop neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and it usually develops within the first two weeks of treatment. It causes confusion, delirium, extreme muscle rigidity, fever, profuse sweating, which would differentiate it from an anticholinergic hyperthermia, tachycardia, label out blood pressure and tachypnea. Another cause of drug-induced fever is serotonin syndrome. And a lot of our patients are on serotonergic uh, medications. And the more serotonergic medications, the higher the risk of serotonin syndrome. So all of these medications are associated with serotonin syndrome, antidepressants, Fentanyl, tramadol, ondansetron, metoclopramide, all of these by themselves or in combination can lead to serotonin syndrome. Diagnosing serotonin syndrome, you can use the Hunter criteria. So the patient must have ingested serotonin agents and then have clonus, either spontaneous or inducible, plus or minus associated with agitation or diaphoresis. Hyperreflexia is a very common symptom, and there you go, fever. So one other cause of medication-induced fever is a drug fever, and this would be a drug reaction. It's usually associated with a rash and can happen with anticonvulsants, allopurinol, and antibiotics. So think about a drug fever in your patient, especially on anticonvulsants. And while we're talking about drugs, I'm just gonna take a little side trip to alcohol because we have patients who have issues with alcohol misuse. And when they stop being able to eat or drink, they may start going through DTs. And severe delirium tremens can be associated with a fever 
as well as delirium, severe tachycardia, hypertension, and drenching sweats. And it usually occurs three to four days after the last alcoholic drink. So the last category we're gonna talk about today is inflammation. So arteritis can certainly cause a fever, especially giant cell or temporal arteritis. And if someone is on steroids for their rheumatological condition and abruptly discontinue their steroids because they're no longer able to take them, they might just have rebound inflammation. And if that's severe enough, it could lead to a fever. So let's go back to the initial question. What about atelectasis? What about dehydration? So in a study looking at post-surgical patients, there was no correlation between timing of atelectasis and timing of fever. Post-op patients get both, but one doesn't cause the other. Fever increases risk of dehydration because you start sweating. But there's no evidence that dehydration in and of itself causes a fever. If you know evidence to the contrary, please reach out, reach out to me and let me know. So let's talk about Ms. Pulley. She's 82. She has advanced heart failure. She has a new onset cough, increased shortness of breath, and a temperature of 101.4. Shouldn't Ms. Pulley be designated as a patient under investigation for COVID? What are your thoughts? So her cough is new and it's persistent and it's dry. She has no increase in weight or edema, no orthopnea, JVD or crackles to suggest an exacerbation of heart failure. She doesn't have problems with dysphagia. I personally would designate Ms. Pulley as a PUI for COVID unless I was gonna do further testing looking for alternative causes. And I'd certainly consider testing her for COVID-19 and isolating her until we had more information. So fever is not uncommon at the end of life. A quarter of patients develop a fever in the last two weeks of life. Always think about the differential diagnosis. When we're taking care of seriously ill, terminally ill patients, we're often called on to, to looking at patients and using our clinical skills and our clinical judgment. So think about the differential diagnosis. Always look at the medication list. Could we have caused the fever? Always consider the incidence of COVID-19 in your area. If you have a high incidence of COVID-19 in your area, you should have a low threshold for designating someone as a patient under investigation for COVID-19 and for testing them. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me. I can be reached at etiller at hopewestco.org. That's etiller at hopewestco.org. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend time with me today. I hope you found the presentation enjoyable and informative. Have a great day.